Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's so wonderful to be worshiping with you all in person again. And I'd like to welcome all those watching on the live stream as well, whether it be live or maybe at a later time. My message title this morning is Truth Be Told. And usually when someone starts a sentence with those three words, you never quite know what's coming next. They may be exposing something or admitting something that they would otherwise lie about. Now, you may not be ready to hear what they have to say or want to accept it, but let me ask you a question. Is the truth always true? I mean, we've all heard two sides of supposedly the same story, with both people claiming to tell the truth but somehow their stories just don't add up. It's like the saying goes, beware of the half truth. You may have gotten hold of the wrong half. But before we get too deep into this, I'd like to begin with an opening prayer, if you'd like to bow your heads with me. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that we can all gather here and worship your name this Sabbath morning. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us here in this place. May the words that I speak not necessarily be the ones that I have planned for, but the ones that you would have me speak, and that our minds and hearts will be receptive to hearing it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to start off this morning by sharing a few top secret health tips with you. I've recently had access to some very confidential research, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to pass some of that knowledge along to you now. So feel free to grab a pen and a paper and take some notes if you'd like. My first tip is... The best way to lose weight is to eat a high-protein diet. Except when the best way to lose weight is to eat a vegan diet. Calcium from dairy is good for you, but dairy is bad for you. Gluten is no problem for people without celiac disease, but everyone should be gluten-free. Fruits, they're okay, but some fruits, like bananas, are so high in natural sugar that you might as well just eat a piece of cake. But be careful not to eat too much cake, or you might end up in the hospital. And don't forget to keep hydrated. But don't drink just any water. Tap water is obviously poison, so try to get alkaline water. Because although we may not realize it yet, most of us are too acidic. Well, there you have it. I've given you all the secrets. After all, it's obvious what you should do now, right? Could it be any clearer? Clear as mud. Because there's so many theories, opinions, and facts swirling around that Sometimes it can be hard to know where the truth actually lies. And I'm not just talking about diet, of course. Just take a look at this past year and how divided we've all been. To wear a mask or not to wear a mask? To get the COVID vaccine or not to get the COVID vaccine? Black lives matter or all lives matter? Anything and everything has become debatable, with both sides passionately fighting to make the other side see that they are right. Now, don't worry, we're not going to debate any of those topics here today, but I do want to start with a thought. Are we placing so much focus on the confusion that we can't see beyond it? Colossians chapter 3 tells us, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, 
seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Okay, sure, let's focus on the truth. That seems easy enough. But wait, question number two. How easily can the truth be manipulated? Well, nowadays, it's almost too easy to twist the truth. Right becomes wrong, up becomes down, black becomes white. We can even make the Bible say anything we want. I want to share an interesting quote with you and see if any of you know who said it. My feeling as a Christian points me to my Lord and Savior as a fighter. It points me to the man who once in loneliness, surrounded by only a few followers, recognized these Jews for what they were and summoned men to fight against them and God's truth. Today, after 2,000 years, with deepest emotion, I recognize these profoundly more than ever that he had to shed his blood upon the cross. As a Christian, I have no duty to allow myself to be cheated, but I have the duty to be a fighter for truth and justice. Now that's a pretty powerful statement. Does anyone have any guesses as to who said that? Well, that was actually from a speech that Hitler made. Hitler's goal was to exterminate the Jews, and he found a way to make the Bible seem to support his actions. I mean, after all, the Bible does say that there's a time to kill and a time to hate. Okay, you might say that's just one verse taken way out of context, but aren't there a few other verses that seem to contradict one another? Like, for example, in Deuteronomy, we find this verse which says, Make no treaty with them, and show them no mercy. But we contrast that with Luke, where it says, Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Or what about the verse in Exodus that says, An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But then Jesus himself tells us in Matthew, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. How confusing. These verses are literally telling us to do one thing, and then a few books later telling us to do the exact opposite. John chapter 8 tells us of the time on the Mount of Olives when the woman caught in adultery was brought to Jesus. The law said to stone such women, but Jesus said, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus knew they were quoting the law, but instead he revealed the heart of God. He was showing us that we cannot create Christian ethics while ignoring Christ. You see, those verses we just looked at may seem like contradictions, but we can't lock Jesus up in the pages of the Bible because he is so much more than the verses we read. He is the living word. John chapter 5 says, You study the scriptures diligently, because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. We can't just isolate Bible verses to arrive at the truth of God, because there is a trajectory in the Bible, a movement away from violence as the norm in the Old Testament and towards peace, in the New Testament. This progression doesn't reach its pinnacle with Joshua or David or anyone else in the Old Testament, but with Jesus Christ. It's not biblical character that we should aspire to, 
but Christ-like character. If we only spoke of biblical character, who would be our pattern? Abraham? Moses? David? Sure, they loved the Lord, but before that, their lives were filled with anger, adultery, and violence. Jesus alone should be our model. But one of the best ways the enemy attempts to draw us away from trusting God is by perverting our perception of God's character. And he may even use Christians to do that. Because truth be told, a lot of Christians are tools in the devil's hands and they don't even know it. People can use any scripture to back whatever they want their position or narrative to be. But without love, just having knowledge of God's word will lead to deception and destruction. We know that we all have knowledge, but while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 It is so important to intentionally listen for God's voice in all that you do, whether it be the books you read, the things you hear, the sermons you listen to, even in this message right now. Because too often, we have a mental understanding of scriptures and their interpretations, but that is only head knowledge. Memorized verses are not the sure foundation on which Jesus builds his church. He said it would be founded on the revealed word. And of course, the revealed word means God himself because some of our questions just can't be answered by the Bible. For example, where should we work? Which church should we join? Whom should we marry? If you do find those answers in the Bible, please let me know. Without the revealed Word of God, those decisions would be founded on unstable ground. What God reveals by His Spirit cannot be taken from us, and that must be the foundation of all we do. It shouldn't be based on other people's opinions or judgments or comments or how we think society will view us. What we learn in the presence of God cannot be learned in the presence of men. One of the most powerful verses in the Bible, in my opinion, is this one. So will my word be which goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the purpose for which I sent it. Isaiah 55, 11. God's word will always accomplish what he set it out to do. Because his word produces. His word has power. In fact, his word is power. For the word that God speaks is alive and full of power. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life and spirit, and of joints and marrow, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. According to anthropologists, we have over 3,814 different cultures all across the world. But in 2017, a new culture emerged. And this culture, especially in the last few years, has become very popular. I'm talking about cancel culture. Tensions are high, tolerance is low, and people are getting canceled left and right. 
Now, in case you haven't heard of it, canceling happens when a person says or does something wrong, or something that's perceived as wrong, and society decides to withdraw all support from them. It could be a wrong word, wrong opinion, wrong anything. Something from even 30 or 40 years ago could be dug up, revealed, strip you of everything you have in your life today, and that failure would now be all you're remembered for. So, where is the real truth in this? Who is this person truly? The person they were before or after they got cancelled? We look to the church for truth and guidance, but sometimes, like our culture, even the church cancels people. But truth be told, our countercultural savior called cancelled people his friends. In fact, his circle of followers included a betrayer, a thief, a prostitute, and oh so many others. He moved towards those whom society moved away from. Now, I know each person may have their own religious or personal convictions, but convictions should never be a catalyst to treat someone poorly. Jesus didn't come to cancel people. He came to cancel the things people do. While our culture cancels the debtor, Jesus canceled the debt. And praise the Lord for that. Colossians 2 says, He forgave all our sins. He canceled the debt, which listed all the rules we failed to follow. He took away that record with its rules and nailed it to the cross. Have you ever wondered why God gives us so much? I mean, he could have left the world flat and gray and we wouldn't have known the difference. If you're driving down the street and you see a homeless person, you probably wouldn't give him all the money you have saved in your bank account. If you were donating some clothes to the Salvation Army, you probably wouldn't give all the clothes in your closet, right? You probably would donate just a couple of things. But what about your life? Would you sacrifice your own life if it meant saving someone in your family or a close friend? Maybe. But what about an acquaintance? A stranger? Or an enemy? Now, you might say, oh, they wouldn't deserve it. But truth be told, Do any of us deserve what Jesus did for us on the cross? Humans may not give you their all, but Jesus already has. Why did Jesus live on earth for as long as he did, for 33 years? Why not step into our world for a week, or just long enough to die for our sins and then leave? Why would he put up with this life? He went through it all because he wants us to trust him. Even his final act on earth was intended to win our trust. And I'm not just talking about the crucifixion itself, but what happened while Jesus was being crucified. He was offered myrrh and gall, which would have had an anesthetic effect on him and numbed his senses so he wouldn't feel any pain. But Jesus refused them. He wanted to feel the full extent of his suffering. He could have easily called on his divine powers to stop the torture, and he could have more easily agreed to take the myrrh. So why would he choose to endure all of that pain in its entirety. Because he knew we would feel that way too in this life. 
He knew we would face pain that would be too sharp for any drug. If not the pain of the body, the pain of the soul. He understands. And because he understands, we can come to him. Let's revisit our scripture reading for today. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Have you ever wondered why there were two crosses next to Christ at Calvary? Why not six or even ten? Could it be that those two crosses symbolize one of God's greatest gifts? The gift of choice. These two criminals had so much in common. They were convicted by the same system. They were condemned to the same death. They were surrounded by the same crowd. And they both said cruel things to Jesus. But one changed. Abel and Cain were both sons of Adam. Abel chose God. Cain chose murder. And God let him. Abraham and Lot were both pilgrims in Canaan. Abraham chose God. Lot chose Sodom. And God let him. David and Saul were both kings of Israel. David chose God. Saul chose power. And God let him. Peter and Judas both denied their Lord. Peter sought mercy. Judas sought death. And God let him. Usually in life, if we're being pressured to make a decision, we start to feel skeptical. But God gives us the freedom to make our own choices. We can choose a narrow gate or a wide gate, a narrow road or a wide road, the big crowd or the small crowd. We can choose to build on the rock or the sand, to serve God or riches, to be numbered among the sheep or the goats. In so many areas of life, we have no choice. We didn't choose our family, our race, or our place of birth. I mean, it would have been nice if God had let us order life like we would a Happy Meal. I'll take good health and a high IQ, and I'd like to be at least 5 foot 8. Oh, and I can't forget to order some music skills. When it came to life on earth, we weren't given a voice or a vote. But when it comes to life after death, we are. There are times when God sends thunder to stir us. There are times when God sends blessings to lure us. And then there are times when God sends nothing but silence as he honors us with the freedom to choose where we spend eternity. And what an honor it is. Each of our lives is so unique, and it's really an amazing thing to think of the many ways all of our lives intersect. Now, I don't know what you've gone through in your life, but I do know that whether you're sitting on a pew here in the sanctuary or on your couch at home watching this live stream, God has brought you to this exact moment. It's been His faithful hand that has held you all this way. Our days on this earth are numbered. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to go through a single day without God by my side. God wants to deliver us and restore to us the joy of salvation. He wants to fill us with His love. But we just need to make that choice to trust Him knowing that if we genuinely keep seeking, asking, and knocking, that he'll be there 
to give us the truth and the peace that we need. In closing, I'd like to share a song that really resonates with this. I actually recorded it for the live stream just before we found out that church would be opening again, so I hope you don't mind that I'll be showing a video rather than playing it for you live, but I'm praying that it will serve as a reminder that nothing in this world can be compared to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us up on that cross. Tell a story If my life would sing a song If I have a testimony If I have anything at all No one else His faithful hand has held me all this way And when I'm old and gray and all my days are numbered on the earth Let it be known in you alone my joy children tell their children let this be their memory that all my treasure was in heaven and you were everything to me His faithful hand has held me all this way And when I'm old and gray and all my days are numbered on the earth Let it be known in you alone my joy
Father in heaven, thank you for your sacrifice in caring for each and every one of us. Let it be known that our joy is found in you alone. And I pray that as we leave this place, we'll go forth knowing that we can trust you with this coming week, that we can trust you with our entire future, and that we can trust that all our treasure is being laid up for us in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.